So Middlesex time, it's five o'clock. Peter Hood time, it's five o'clock. I'd say we're good to go. Welcome everybody. Welcome guests. Um, would you? Would, I, I ask you to introduce yourselves every week, but if there are people on Zoom, they're not going to know who you are. So would you introduce yourselves, please? Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. And Ann Gilbert on the Zoom. Ann Gilbert, yeah. I'm the director of Central Vermont New Directions Coalition, the um, substance use prevention coalition in uh, serving Washington County with funding from the Vermont Department of Health. And my colleague, Sultana Khan, is joining us tonight, too. She's um, uh, Sultana's working with Mosaic Vermont. Okay, we'll be we'll be with you in about one minute. Okay. Um, so we need to approve our agenda for tonight. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Okay, and we need to approve the minutes of the April fourth regular select board meeting. Is there a motion? I move that we accept the, meeting, or the uh, minutes of the, uh, the April 4th. I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of approving the minutes of April 4th, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. aye. If I um, was on Zoom, same. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Um, any opposed? Okay. We've approved our minutes. Thank you. So the first item on our agenda is considering a Municipal Cannabis Control Commission, Ann Gilbert of New Directions, possibly to attend. She is attending. Action possible. Wait, can I? I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> what is this second piece of the 505, reviewing, amending, and improving the agenda for April 18th? Is that something that we do now? That's our new practice, yes. But did we do that? I don't think we did. I think we just approved well, the minutes of April 4th. I said there were no amendments to the agenda so i presume that was so approval. that means we don't have to approve it okay okay all right i move that we approve the uh, agenda for april 18 2023 and i second it okay all in favor of approving the agenda for tonight's meeting Aye. any opposed okay Peter, i just want to uh, before you get into the cannabis control thing I have printed out a leaflet from the state of Vermont about cannabis control commissions, and I've highlighted tasks like those little blue tags or green tags there speak to municipal, the municipal, municipal powers of the cannabis control commission if you want to refer to something during while Ann is talking. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. So with that, and I guess you're on to tell us about cannabis control commissions. Okay. So um, to give you a, a little bit of um, uh, information, I have um, spoken to the Middlesex Planning Commission um, on a couple of occasions and shared some documents with um, Sandy Levine and others. And so I'm not sure. Um, exactly how uh, or what information has already been passed on to you. Um, I just didn't want to be redundant. Um, but um, I guess what I'll, I'll explain is there's a cannabis control board, which is the state entity, which is making all the decisions about retail cannabis. And since Middlesex has already voted to opt in for retail cannabis, um, uh, it's good for you to know that there is a, an opportunity for there to be more local control um, by creating a, a Cannabis Control Commission, a CCC, which is different than the Cannabis Control Board, the CCB, which is the state, the Vermont state entity. So for local control, it would mean that there would be a group, which is often the select board, but also made up of other members as well, maybe people from public health or uh, law enforcement or people who work in Middlesex, even though they might live somewhere else, 
because of commerce, who would um, uh, who would who would approve the licenses, much like you do for alcohol and tobacco already. Um, now, when I originally started talking to um, the Planning Commission about this, there were some very concerning um, facts about how how retail how applicants were going to apply and how they would be approved. And so I thought it was really important for there to be information for Middlesex to have um, to have a, a local more local control. As now we've had retail cannabis under our belts for a number of months now. I think there's been some changes so that um, I, maybe maybe it's not as much urgency because I don't think there's as much local control um, a, as we originally thought. What it really comes down to is a town really envisioning what, what you what you want to see and maybe even imagining what you do not want to see. And so being able to put ordinances in place that involve signs, um, how big uh, how big are the signs? Um, you know, is it neon? You know, what would be allowed or not? And also public nuisances. Some of the things that other towns and other states have encountered in terms of nuisances with retail cannabis um, operations might be um, uh, the uh, or or grow facilities would be the light trespass um, might be the odor um, and uh, or or dust so um, but all of these things cannot be specific to just cannabis they would have to be um, across the board for all substances um, so it, it, it would really have to be, it would have to pertain to everything. You can't single out just cannabis for some of these, um, these ordinances. So right now, if um, someone wants to apply to have a retail cannabis apple, um, uh, up store, it will go, they'll, they'll have to get a permit or they'll have to um, follow all the permitting processes through your town and then get a license through the state. If you have a local cannabis control commission, then you would issue that local license. One of the concerns months ago was that a town might not even know that, a, that someone had applied and that the, and that the state had issued um, a license, you, and and then you would find out. Um, but now it looks like an applicant will have to follow all the the zoning development review board, whatever it is through the town, and so you you will know. So um, then it will be either if if you have this cannabis control commission, your own local commission, you will essentially be rubber stamping that application. Um, one other thing is if, if the state is the one that um, grants this application for a license, and if there's any kind of problem that violates the zoning or the you know the signage or um, the nuisances having a local control can um, cannabis com commission would allow you to take care of that work with them maybe revoke that license if needed if needed as opposed to waiting for the state entity to and their team to investigate it um, and then revoke the license at the state level so there are some towns that um, even though they haven't opted in, they're already putting together their own um, local cannabis control commission, like Stowe, for instance, um, and other towns that have already opted in are, are, are having this as well, just as um, another place to be able to have better communication, um, be able to review those applications um, the way you do with alcohol. Mm -hmm. 
there any questions about that or thoughts about whether you would want to do that or not want to do that for certain reasons? So the way I see this is that it would be not the same as, but similar to the way we control alcohol sales. In other words, the state does all the behind the scenes part, the investigating, everything. They approve it, then we have to approve it before they can open up in Middlesex. If you have a local control commission and you notify the Cannabis Control Board that you do have your own commission, then yes. Yes. And for myself, I think that's a good thing. I mean, I think it's good for the board to know who's, whether it's alcohol or cannabis or whatever it is, to know what's going on in town and to have it be another step beyond the planning and zoning process, I think is good. We do not routinely get involved in planning and zoning issues unless there's a problem. So it makes sense to me that we would that we would want to do this, but I don't know how other board members feel. Yeah, Liz. Um, can I ask Ann a question? Yes. Um, hi, Ann. Hi. Um, so let's say Red Hen, for example, which already has a building and they're an established business, decides they want to sell cannabis brownies. Is that doesn't, that wouldn't, and if we don't have this commission control this, the CCC, they don't need to go to our development, re they don't need to go to our zoning for that. Or do they, because they're selling cannabis? Like, is that something that we, somewhere in the town we would hear that a company that already exists, like Roots, for example, or Red Hen, or the mm -hmm. liquor, that new alcohol store might sell something, but they're already established? So my understanding is then if, they would just apply through the state. And, and so, you know, it's sort of like, you know, what, what you were just talking about of, it's good to know what's happening in your town and what that looks like and, and, um, and who's involved. Um, uh, yeah, ahead of time. Right. So, but if we didn't have that CCC, we wouldn't know that Red Hen started selling products with marijuana in it because they are they wouldn't go through any other process because they're not building anything. They're not a new business, right? So what would that um, what what would that permitting process? Yeah, what what would they have to do? No, I don't know. No, there would be no. There would be nothing. What, that we what I think we're saying is we don't believe there would be any town permitting process because they're already a permitted business. They would get their state cannabis license and they'd be ready to go if they didn't need a town license. So we and that's yeah. a and reason so that's, to that's have reason the to Cannabis have Control Commission so that they yeah. have to apply to us. And guess what? If there's a problem, it gives us the ability to revoke that license, right. which I think has some value. And then can I ask another question? Yes. So, and then, Anna, if you could go back to that statement about you know, um, signage, for example, um, mm -hmm. and that, or, cause I mean, I, I will say that I've read articles, um, that like places like California that have, you know, big marijuana fields that it's really challenging for neighbors because of the smell. Right. And that to me is like a whole separate like issue, but you're saying that like, we would have to say that about a farm that has manure spreading, that they'd have to control the smell because we can't be, we can't Can say be just specific. cannabis. Right. So, and I, ha, like, what are, our, what are towns doing about that piece? We're not, I, I mean, I would just say, you know, we have very little, if any, control over agriculture, as we know. Yeah. So I presume the same would apply to cannabis. I mean, that would, be, that would be the state agriculture commissioner or I don't know who. But towns, we have no control over. Unless it's a nuisance, like she's saying. You make a yeah, but even if it policy. is a nuisance, like the manure is a perfect example. Right. I, I do think, I think this has come up and I don't have all the information on that of um, how, how manure would be treated differently. But I will say that um, there 
there has been a grow and processing facility in um, another town in, in southern Vermont where the smell was so strong. And unfortunately, there was um, a recovery center that had opened up like almost next door. So people who are really struggling and really trying to avoid all substances were suddenly exposed to this. And luckily it was, they were able to just have, a, I don't know, kind of a good neighbor conversation about it. And the facility agreed to only process or um, uh, dry at certain times in order to, um, you know, cut back on the nuisance that it was that it was causing, and and so I think it is about relationships, you know, being able to know who 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 has these businesses, as it would be with any other product as well, I guess. But um, uh, I I don't know specifically. Um, about the, you know, how, how you how you would control the the smell of manure or how this does or does not relate to that. Victor. A couple of things. We already have that right up here. I mean, you can smell that stuff if you're in that area. Oh, you can? Yeah. Yeah, we were paving there last year, and you could you smell, can smell it over it. the pavement. Oh, you know, yeah. I have smelled it, and I was like, who's out in the Skunk. woods smoking pot? <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's I so think... weird. That's exactly okay. what it is. I think the light, the grow light has been a problem also from some facilities and the energy use in the water. Sultana, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say there is one way that I've heard getting around this, which is uh, regulations around particular compounds uh, so that you're addressing some of the chemical that creates the odor. Um, as opposed to uh, addressing a broad odor, odor regulation. So um, there is like, a, there's like four to five weeks during the grow season that during the flowering time, it's particularly pungent. And there's a particular chemical that creates that smell. And so the, the regulation of that chemical uh, is like sometimes used. And I'm gonna throw in the chat uh, a link to an article that talks about this from the National Institute of Health. Mm -hmm. So it does seem like this is a thing that people are concerned about uh, and you know, odor control and they're looking for solutions to it, but it doesn't sound like anybody has any particularly good solutions to it, but that is one of the things that's mentioned in the article. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. But this CCC, we don't have to have a CCC in order to go through any kind of changes or regulations that we'd want around nuisance or signage and stuff like that. Those are two separate things. So what we're really talking about tonight is the CCC, but it doesn't really affect what you were talking about in terms of just because we have a CCC um, doesn't, that's not going to give us any leverage necessarily to those changes. We have to do other things on a planning level, like a town planning exactly. level. Okay. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. All right. Yes. So, okay. Yes. And, and. You know, a, a retail cannabis shop has a lot of specific, um, you know, uh, guidelines they have to follow. So, um, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think Red Hen can just start selling cannabis right now, even though we have they have an established business. Mm -hmm. No, they'd have to get a state license. Yeah, and do a bunch and of other And follow the rule, yeah, whatever the rules yeah. are. That they probably are. It's, it seems to me that the, the development of this commission doesn't really give us a, a whole lot of authority, really. It's, it's more about, to me, at least what I'm understanding, uh, the state's got laws around this. That's, that's essentially what folks are bound to, and we can't be more restrictive than, than what those state uh, guidelines are. It really just gives us the opportunity to know, you know what's happening within 
you know, the town as far as who's, who's involved with cannabis in any way, shape, or form that they'd have to get a permit for. Um, and potentially to have some control power if there are issues, which we would have with, by revoking somebody's liquor license, for instance. Yeah. Not that I anticipate we would have any problems, but I mean, our, our role is going to be relatively minimal. It's more informational than anything else, the way I see this. Yes, Victor. I like the way you say our. Um, I think for my own, I think that when, when Ann said that you could get people that work here or something to be on the, on the board, I don't think that's good. I think it should be the select board and maybe just the select board itself for now. I don't think we ought to. I don't think. I, I agree. That's that's okay. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, I don't think we need to create okay. another board or commission. Make, I, I mean, make I, as, as much as possible. I'm thinking we and I realize it isn't the same thing, but we want to treat this the same way we treat liquor licenses, which we don't have a liquor commission, but the select board is essentially the liquor commission. Well, you sign it. You we approve yeah. the permit. Right. So we would have to figure out if, you know, if we have the CCC, if that's a separate meeting from our select board meeting, you know, if we adjourn the select board meeting and can have a CCC. Well, we don't know. I mean, this, this is going to be a learning process, I think, for us, but it's going to be a learning process across the state, too. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, one other thing I just want to make sure that you're aware of it. You know, it's really uh, trying to think ahead of, like, what, what what this could would look like in in your town of Middlesex in terms of um, more growth of retail cannabis um, establishments and uh, if if you do have some of these zoning ordinances in place then you can fall back on those they 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 will have to be followed but if they're not in place and a retailer opens and then you're you're they're um, not following uh, what, you know, then you feel like you have problems. Um, they've already been grandfathered in so that you, you would not be able to revoke that license because they were not established when there were certain guidelines that they had to get a permit for following. So I guess just thinking about wh whether, you know, just having the the commission be the the select board be the commission right now is enough or if you want to be thinking more about okay what what do we want to think about signage or nuisances um involved in this so i just had a quick yes. question for those towns that have approved the commissions did they um there's boilerplate language on the board's website um did folks pretty much adopt that language were certain towns, um, were there issues coming up in certain towns where they made significant changes to that language? Um, not that I know of where um, they were responding to problems, but they did it ahead of time. Um, and generally? More generally, yeah. Um, now, uh, there's already, you know, in terms of zoning, there's already the, the Cannabis Control Board has um, dictated that it cannot be within 500 feet of a school, um, for instance, but that is only for retail cannabis. It, you know, you can't control, you can't control any of the other operations like, um, you know, agricultural ones. Um, or, or a medical cannabis facility. This is only for a retail store. And then say we do have the commission and the license is approved um, and there, a situation did arise, would, if we revoked the license at the town level, um, would then, and what is the recourse for the applicant? Um, well, you could, you know, it could be, oh, you know, um, how, do, how do you, 
you know, solve the problem of whatever it is, you know, is there, um, is- but if, I'm just wondering if they have the license at the state level. Oh. And the state doesn't do anything. Yeah. And at the town level. Oh. What happens then? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, you know, I, I just think that uh, my understanding is that if you have a local control, um, your cannabis control commission, that you're the ones who can revoke that license. Um, uh, if, but if, if you felt like it should be revoked and the state, but they had already gotten it through the state, it might be a much lengthier process for them to investigate it and work, you know, their team to address that issue. I think the, so I think the answer would potentially have. would be that their recourse would be through the courts. They could appeal our decision through the courts. Right. But Normally, just like any other decision we make. Uh, wait, I'm confused. Yeah, right. And are you saying that we would be giving, they wouldn't have to go through the state if we had a commission, they would go directly no. through us? No. 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 They still have to. They have to have an approval from the state, and then they come to us, just like with the liquor. But I didn't hear her say that in the beginning. Go ahead, Ann. No, I think it's it would come to you first, and then they would get it from the state. So, uh, but if you do not, but if you don't have your commission, then then it goes directly to the state. Sarah has a question. That seems backwards to me. So, yes, I mean, Sarah. I think the way it works is the way it works with liquor with liquor licenses. This will pop up, and then the state says, "Does the local authority approve this?" And if the local authority approves this, then it goes to the next level. Then the state signs off on it. So you, if you stop, if it says the local authority does not approve it, then that ends that ends it right there. There's not going to be any retail. If you say yes, then uh, it goes to the state, and then the state can do whatever. So it's, it's, it's the same whatever. process. Yeah, same process. But we don't have to create a application. You that are, is something. You are theoretically the you know, you're theoretically the board of liquor control, and you're also the board of uh, health. And where do they get that application? Not on our website. No, they would probably go through the own through, process. So yeah. we, there's probably there's something that's going to have to come. And then it first it. comes to us, and we approve it. Then it goes right. to the state. Gotcha. But that that does sound a little bit more. There's more teeth there than what I'm hearing from Ann. So, um, so uh, I, what I'm hearing from Ann is more of a rubber stamping situation. No. No, I don't, don't think so. Know. I mean, if if we have reason to deny the license, and we deny it. They're okay. done. Can't we, can't we stop any action we want if it's detrimental to the public? You can't go above the laws. <laughs> no, I'm not yes. asking you to go above it the can't, law. It can't be more restrictive than the state law, but my understanding based on what I read uh, earlier today was just what Sarah had said. It's essentially my, my vision of this would be that they would go through, apply to the state, the state informs the commission um, and and checks with them for their approval, and then it would follow through the rest of the process at the state for them to to grant the final. They initiate it through the license. state. They I initiate believe. it through the yes. state. It comes to us, and then it goes back to the state right. for final giving the license. Right. The bottom line is, I did, I did say I did say rubber stamping in that um, if they've already. Um, you know, followed all, you know, uh, the whole permitting process that they have everything in place as, as far as um, it, it's in line with whatever ordinances, whatever, whatever, whatever your zoning um, is, then you're essentially rubber stamping it. If they've, if they've just completed that process and it passes all the permitting. Right. Except for the fact that there's nothing in the planning. The planning process dictates what they have to do to open a business in the town of Middlesex, what they have to do to develop the building, where they're going to do it, all that kind of all that kind of stuff. But it does not have anything to do with their ability to sell cannabis. Right. The planning the planning process has nothing to do with that. So we are the ones, just like we do with liquor, Correct. we are the ones who say yes, you can have a class two liquor license, or no, you can't. Right. And it's not a rubber stamp. It's our it's our decision. I think it's where the confusion is coming in. Okay. That makes sense, I hope. Yeah. So well, the bottom good. line is folks, I mean we can we can table this, we can think about it, we can yeah. decide tonight that we're gonna go ahead. I think we have the information we need, unless 
anybody has any other questions. But I think, I just want to clarify, I believe that when they go through the zoning process, because we were a town that voted to allow for certain, like the application will say that it's a cannabis. They're not just going to say, I want to build a new no, building. No, 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 no. I want to build a retail store to sell cannabis. Right. And then and the planning is going to say, yeah. yes, it's allowed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're going to come to us. Okay. So what's your any, pleasure? I don't have any more questions. Board members. I'm fine with establishing a cannabis control commission right now. But what about the language we, list? What did you, did you want to adopt that? I mean, the I. The board suggested the resolution. Board. I have, I, I typed up a, the, I used the cannabis, sample cannabis control uh, resolution dated today with your names on it if you wanted to read it, if you wanted to pass it. Thank you. Read it out loud, Randy. Whereas Title Seven, Chapter 33 of Vermont State Statutes was amended in 2020 to provide for safe, equitable, and effective regulation of adult use cannabis, and whereas Seven VSA 863B provides that a municipality that hosts any cannabis establishment may choose to establish a cannabis control commission. <coughs> And whereas a local control commission may issue and administer local control license for cannabis establishment within the municipality, and whereas the commission may condition the issuance of a local control license upon compliance with any bylaw adopted pursuant to 24 VSA 4414 or ordinance regulating signs or public nuisances adopted pursuant to 24 VSA 2291, and whereas the Local Control Commission may suspend or revoke a local control license for a violation of any condition placed upon the license pursuant to 7 VSA 863B, and whereas prior to issuing a cannabis establishment license, the State Cannabis Control Board must ensure that an applicant has obtained a local control license if a municipality has established a local control commission. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Middlesex Select Board has voted firmly to form a local cannabis control commission effective as of the date of this resolution, April 18th, 2023. Be it further resolved that the local commission will be comprised of the Select Board be it further resolved that the local Cannabis Control Commission of Middlesex will A, review information provided by the State Cannabis Control Board, B, review information provided by applicants for the approval or denial of a local control license, C, will communicate approval, denial, or conditions placed on the local control license to licensees and the, to the State Cannabis Control Board, and D, comply with the provisions of 7 VSA 863 and Cannabis Control Board Rule 2.14. So moved. So moved. Liz. I'll second it. Okay, moved by Victor, seconded by Liz. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I think we've done it. Thank you. Thank you for your help and your information. Oh, great. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Sarah, for preparing that. Yes, thank you. Okay. Joint meeting with the Middlesex Volunteer Fire Department, consideration of approval of the memorandum of understanding for the capital fire mutual aid action likely. And we do have in our packet a report. Gentlemen. So <clears throat> I thought, um, uh, Joe. Joe, Joe was gonna be on, but. Right. So he sent the information you guys were looking for. Um, as far as I know, that's, does that, okay. does that, do the information he sent you answer your questions? I don't have any further questions. 
I'm ready to adopt this memorandum. Yeah, just go ahead. I'll make the I motion that we accept. How about that? Are we, are we going to talk about this right now? Yes. Yeah, so he's making a motion to accept it. Okay. And I'll second it. Okay, I can't hear it. I'm sorry. Vic okay, made Victor a motion that we accepted moved it. moved and Liz okay. seconded that we accept the memorandum. Okay, great. I'm understanding. I'm understanding. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No? It's unanimous. We've approved it. Done. Okay. Now for the monthly report. Wait, before we go on. Um, can you please designate somebody to sign on behalf of the board because it's by party, by party. I assume one of the parties is town of Middlesex, right? And the other party is... Yep. So when you add that, can somebody just designate somebody to do that? I would include Peter Hood Thank in you. the motion. Okay, so... Here we go. This is what I'm looking for. So I guess I just signed this under party one. Sarah? I don't know. It says party by name title, party by name title. Let's yeah. do party one. Okay, so for the monthly report, um, we're up to 24 calls. We had seven calls. Uh, it's the same as we had last month. Zero mutual aid out or mutual aid in. Um, max number was six. Min number was two for an average of 3.14. Engine out, engine one was out two times. Um, engine six zero, tanker one out three times, rescue out one time, and truck 14 not out. So the calls, the first couple of calls, we were canceled before we could get out. Actually, the second one, the accident was actually in Montpelier. We got toned first, and then they realized, oh, it was exit 8, not exit 9. Uh, we had a propane odor and a water heater. That was leaking, so it was put out of service. There was a call for a lift assist, someone that wasn't hurt on Center Road. Mead Road had a large fire in the backyard. They did have a burn permit. Um, there was a fire alarm activation on Route 2 at the um, well over temporary use facility. Uh, water heater caught on fire but was out by the time um, we got over there. And then there was a grass fire on Rich Road. Our training was ladder work, uh, repairs. I did meet with Borns to get an estimate. They were the first ones that I lined up. Um, the estimate is $12,870.33 for complete removal and replacement of essentially the boiler. Uh, the rest of the system would operate, and that's not the only one. And if we get the other grants to do further studies and whatnot, we'll certainly uh, include those as well. Uh, but the big thing is we've got quite an investment in that heating system aside from the boiler for all the tubing course, in, yeah. and, and so. Um, that's what we're looking at. How's um, the domestic hot water provided down there? Pardon? How's the domestic hot water provided the boiler? Through that same system. It's as, an, as a separate indirect tank off from the boiler? No, the, the, the way the one works now, it's kind of like an inst instantaneous heater. It's got a very small tank. So when the, a sink calls for hot water or one of the two zones calls for hot water, it turns on. So that would be the same type thing. There isn't a separate hot water heater tank and a separate... Um, basically, it's just one boiler. So if you had baseboard heat, you're probably getting the same kind of thing. Um, Can you remind me, um, did you say that it's broken and beyond repair right now? It is. According to the technician last month, it is limping along to get us through the heating season. Um, his recommendation is to not put any more money into it. And just for my uneducated eye, I can see there's a, a copper pipe that is probably going to pop here. Could be today, could be two months from now. But you can see some some corrosion right on a copper pipe. 
it's what one of the main feeding pipes to it um, so their recommendation is is to replace it um, and so that's we're trying to limp it along to the heating system get more estimates on replacing it but the plan is to that it well it's not it's not a plan we have to replace it before heating season starts up yep. um, Randy did you um, uh, get the sense that um, in that meeting today that once we can basically get our name in to have the assessments done that I almost feel like we're kind of doing an assessment already with this place and that we would prioritize the fire department as like our first request. Yeah, so like, it sounds like we can put it, put in requests for multiple buildings and essentially they would package them, but the request is by for each building by itself, but they would package it under that entire application. For the um, assessment? Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> So it, did we, we have to prioritize it though? Did we have to say we want we want if you can only do one, we want you to do this? I didn't. I don't that believe sense. so. I okay. think we can put them both in at the same time. They would be separate requests or applications right. for each each building. Yeah. Um, and and then make we, sure we include the township too. Yeah. 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 So I think to to answer where I think you're going with that, they could happen simultaneously. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And that is if they don't have the application out white yet but it sounds like it's imminent yes. I mean because they and which means that and it's free like we don't need to pay for this but we need to actually get in the queue essentially um, and then they arrange for a service someone to come out and assess the buildings for um, the energy efficiencies and heating system replacements mm -hmm. that's a part of this MERP you reiterate who are they? Yeah. The Merck people. No. <laughs> the Municipal Energy Resilience, Resilience Program. Program. That's through the state. That is the $500,000 grant that in order for us to apply for that grant, we have to do this. We have to first get into a, the queue to get, um, to get the buildings assessed that we may want to do work on or use this grant to fund. Um, and it sounded like today as well that you could fund multiple buildings so that, you know, if you, if we couldn't spend all of the 500000 on the town hall, we could also include this. One of the barriers is going to be, though, um, potentially that that money is not available before heating season. That was told today, you know, that they're working really hard to try to get that application out before heating system. So I would, you know, hopefully this assessment, they might be able to, because, you know, I would want to get a second opinion that, you know, if we only had to put in a you know, few thousand dollars to repair in order to replace a whole system for free under a grant, I'd rather do that than spend money on a boiler that isn't in our town plan for energy purposes. Is there any resale value? Would boards be willing to buy back if we were to replace within a certain time? I did not ask that. You mean if they installed a, a new system, they would buy it back? I didn't ask or that. Or is there any resale value at all that the town might be able to recoup? So typically it becomes uh, a warranty and liability issue. Gotcha. Um, and in mm -hmm. most instances, um, those vendors will not mm -hmm. entertain that idea. Gotcha. We could probably sell it. Right. And a private party could, I mean, I, I presume what, I don't know how many BTUs it is, but chances are it would service a large house. The, so, you know, some, an individual family could buy it and hire a plumber to install it. And then if we say, say something else happens, though, as I can see it, though, if, you, if we paid to service it and then something else were to happen and we had to service it again, you could get quickly to half of that <coughs> without... Right. And then be in heating system, and then everybody's busy, and then right. No, I know. Yeah. I think it's there's a rip. there's definitely a concern that we are going to just now. The other option would be that we look at we still get that assessment and we see what it is to, but I, I don't. It, it's not retroactive um, in terms of like oh we can pay for it and then have to pay for it afterwards. Right. 
Um, but there are other people having this conversation, and it sounded like it's not like, I don't want to just say, oh, okay, this is just not going to be time. Let's just get a new boiler today. Did anybody, did anybody actually ask that question? I didn't, they I, did. They did. I and didn't they said, they, the, the question was, will this grant be available for the 2023 heating system? I, I heard that, yeah. but I was actually referring to the question about... Um, oh, reimbursement? So if, if, yeah. if there were recommendations underneath the assessment and we move forward with some of those recommendations using town funds whether or not they could be reimbursed through the grant uh, after the fact because you're following the recommendations of the assessment. Yeah, let's ask that I think that'd be a good Trevor. question to That's a good question. To ask. And then, Jeff, how many other um, estimates are you looking to get? Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to get one from Radiant Tech, who Radiant Floor is their specialty, mm -hmm. so see what they do. Um, and then I haven't thought of it. I don't know of any others right now. The Borns was because that's who we get our that's who services it and yeah. who we get our heating fuel from, and Radiant Tech because I know what they do. I haven't researched any other companies yet, but I want to get get at least a couple more. Okay, I've got the uh, name that was given to me yesterday. Okay, Peak Mechanical is just out of uh, Waterbury. Um, very reputable business. Um, they they. I'm sure they're busy, but um, I'd be happy to if if it helps you make a connection there. Yeah, if you could um, either give Sarah and she'll send it to me, or sure, um, that'd probably be that that way. It's yep. Um, but yeah, and the other the other long pole the the estimate for this was it's good for 30 days on the form that they gave us. Um, I'm sure if we ended up going that route and we went over the 30 days, but, but trying to line somebody up is going to be, you know, if we wait until August, we're going to be screwed. I think we'll be down there with it. Lucky's is a Middlesex heating, plumbing and heating too, Lucky's. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll provide Sarah with a list. Um, I don't know his first name, but we used him, uh, Lucky's. Lucky Boardman is the owner of that business. Yeah. Really nice guy. I can, I'll provide Sarah with a couple of names that, okay. that we've interacted with. One other question, Jeff. What's the warranty on the new boiler? Do we know? I don't know if that was on the, sh on the form. I'll, I can look at it and, and okay. let you know on that. I, I hadn't, right now. My understanding is, and maybe you know, Randy, but my understanding is they used to warranty them for 20 or 30 years. Now they warranty them for like five years or 10 years or... If you could get a relatively that short model. period, <laughs> no. the, I know. No, the, no, no. the tech said that the life expectancy of that boiler is 10 to 15, uh, the one that's going is 10 to 15 years. We're in that window. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but I'll, I'll find out on the warranty. Okay. Thank you. Um, Uh, still waiting to hear from Zoll on the AED. I emailed him again um, to ship it. We're all set up, but I don't know if they're having supply chain issues or what. Uh, have not heard back from Lake Region Fire Apparatus yet. Um, now, a, a something all near and dear to our hearts, recruitment. You may have seen ads on TV starting this, I think, this weekend. I was away last week um, about a statewide open house uh, thing. So we're going to talk about that at the meeting tonight and probably go forward with that. Um, just I haven't been able to research it yet, but there's a, a website and there are a bunch of, I recognize some of the departments that are, have already, that are in the ad. So we're going to be looking at doing that. The open house is next month. Like it's either 13th. the 13th. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're going to look at trying to do that. Certainly can't hurt. Right. So and their, their website has a whole bunch of stuff. Like I just didn't get a chance to deep dive into it yesterday. Um, as far as the Fast Squad, we've had a total of 10 uh, reports, or it, sh it should be a total of 12, uh, 10 medical and two uh, in conjunction with the fire department. Thank you. Any questions, anyone? 
Yes. I'm Bill Huntsman from Putnamville. Yes, Bill. And I have a concern about the fire department. <laughs> and I'm not going to join Middlesex. I did 40 years in Montpelier. <laughs> I had a chimney fire. It was towing three times from Middlesex, and nobody showed up. When was this? Uh, March 5th. And Worcester was towing three times, and a half hour after that, Worcester showed up. Three guys did. My question is, why wasn't Montpelier towed out? After three times in Middlesex, I don't know what the protocol is. So I was there. So the the call, call. your EMS call came in first. Yep, and Montpelier ambulance called in. The their other ambulance fire. was out on another call. So they called in the chimney fire. Yeah, there was to, to Capital West. Capital West toned out Middlesex only. They should have toned out Middlesex and Montpelier. Mm -hmm. The likelihood of Montpelier having somebody with both ambulances out are slim to none. They were um, ready because I already talked with them. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying, my, I don't want to argue. My, my, just telling my experience is when they've got both ambulances out, they don't have much of personnel in house. So my house but burns. I, I'm just saying that's, that's on Montpelier. We did have, I wasn't able to respond to that, so I would have been responding from the yeah. schoolhouse side. Yeah. The engine, engine one did respond mm -hmm. fairly quickly from when Capital West toned out, but from the station down here over to Putnamville, even with red lights on, takes a while. The in route, they called for Worcester and one of the uh, Worcester people showed up. And uh, my, after talking to um, who responded, they went in, the, the smoke was, has already stopped coming out of the chimney, and they went through top to bottom with the tick looking for it, and nothing was found. So it was burning. Uh, by the time, because when they loaded me in the ambulance, it was burning. I can tell you right now, it was burning. <laughs> so we just we just need to direct a conversation. If you could direct the conversation to me rather than between the two yeah, of you. No, that's, yeah. Thank yeah. you. I mean, we're old scout people. Boys got people. Um, no, I get it. But I just, I just concerned that, you know, I mean, I live in Putnamville. Every somebody else must live that far out and stuff like that. I, I just can't believe that, you know, it took that long. It's the middle of a workday. Well, I realize that. And Worcester is has um, about as many people in town during the day as we do. Montpelier, like I said, was strapped. Their, their next call, had they been toned out, and I do not know why Capital West didn't tone Montpelier, because that's a chimney fire is considered a structure fire, and with structure fires, uh, Montpelier is an automatic tone out. It's supposed to be. Why that didn't happen, I do not know. The follow-on, if Montpelier, Montpelier probably would have called Berry City is their next route, instead of uh, Berlin, or Waterbury. So you would have been looking at coming from Berry City with an engine. So what's happening with Waterbury coming on their side of Middlesex and Montpelier coming on like Putnamville side of Middlesex, half, split in half? Montpelier. Has anything talked about that? Because I've talked to both stations and they're all in for it. I don't know what the what it's it's what's Middlesex doing or having to do with it or what well, we've what well, we've been told and correct me Jeff if I'm wrong but that if it's this side of town they will potentially tone out Waterbury if it's on the other side of town your side of town they would potentially tone out Montpelier Montpelier my, my gets toned to everything in Middlesex Waterbury is basically from Water, we can, we can have Waterbury toned out wherever we want. We can, have, we can have any department toned out wherever we want. Peter, would you have yeah. tell us what toned out means? We don't, for the so, people. So that's when. when toned a, in, a, toned out, what's that mean? A station is called. So you get, you get a, a tone over the radio Sorry that says that. that you're getting alerted to when respond the, yeah. to a call. When the dish, dispatch center says, we need you guys. This is, that's a toenail. 
Oh, okay. I would think that you know, so. Because you get, we have a pager and it gets a tone. Out. And then if you're called off, what is that called? They'll send, it's, a, it's, it's the same, it's a cancellation tone. They send the same tone. Each department has a unique tone. Some people listen to the pagers and radios all the time and they know which tone is which. But ours, after the tone goes off, it says whatever department, you have whatever the call is. And so then that gets the ball rolling of response. In addition to that, we have, um, as, the, as a fire progresses, we have um, increased numbers of alarms, which would, in, by telling Capital West, the dispatch, that we have an increased number of alarms, they will go to what's called a run sheet that has down on what pieces of equipment from where should be called. So we don't have to say, oh, I want Waterbury engine and two <coughs> tankers, I want Moortown and engine and tanker and people. That run card, by us saying this, they go to that run card and they, they tone out the other towns, they call out the other towns to respond with the things that we want. It reduces radio traffic and it makes it a much faster process than then one of us calling, hey, we want this, 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 and this, which is tying up the radio for that long. And then they've got to go and tie up the radio more for getting those people out. Um, so the way it's supposed to, like I said, the way it's supposed to be set up, Montpelier should have been toned out. Why? I don't know. Waterbury is not an automatic tone. We request them whenever ever we need them. Um, our policy is to get people moving earlier rather than later. Um, in case we'd much rather turn them back, it's easier to turn them back than it is to get them out. So uh, that's why when they left here with engine one, they turned out Worcester, even before they got there waiting to find out what was going on. Randy, um, curious about, um, well, my understanding based on what I've heard is that you guys got, the, got, got called out started the process and it sounds like you were called off at some point because other folks sounds like from Worcester were on site and said that it was you know contained or whatever and and nothing was on fire is that my understanding off base there or? no i believe we went to the scene okay we yeah we there. we responded with engine 1 and our engine had the thermal imaging camera to go inside and Okay, so you guys went in and did some of the scanning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I had a different impression based on what I was hearing. And uh, there was another, I don't know who did it, Worcester or Middlesex, opened up the wood stove and smoked the whole house up, and then they don't have any fans. You guys have fans on the truck, don't you? Yeah, we have an exhaust fan. Yeah. The neighbors came in with fans to clean my house up. The only reason I say that is I'm a fireman. You know, it was for 40 years, and it just, things didn't work out right. And I'm just concerned that, you know, I'm not the only one that lives out in the country. You know, I realize, volunteer, I'm not, I don't know. I've only been to two fires where I waited for the fire truck to get there. Because my players got hydrant systems, and I've never waited for trucks to get there. They beat you there. And that's my concern is... I mean, volunteer fire departments. I mean, I know people are working stuff like that, but my player was ready because I went down after. The only reason I wasn't there at my house is because I fell off my roof and broke my back. That's why I wasn't there. <laughs> I was I was headed for the hospital and they were. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had a bad experience. I mean. The fire, the rural fire protection is a problem, especially during the day when people aren't available. There's no question about it. And uh, everybody does the best they can do, but it isn't always perfect. I realize that. No, I realize that. But I will say Mopey was ready to roll because I've talked to Bobby, I've talked to the guy that was on duty, and they never got toned out. Well, it was there. And they wanted to go. They were sitting there waiting for a tone, but they won't go because they weren't called. They, they, they should have been. They should have been, and their that's their ambulance made the call to Capital West. That's that's all I can say yeah. as to why they weren't. I don't know um, why they didn't call Capital West and say, "Hey, do you want us to go?" Um, 
to jog their memory. I, I know they've gotten some new um, dispatchers. It's a learning process. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. Well, there's a fire truck on Craigslist that we're looking at buying. <laughs> Can I ask you just to You're putting it in Putnamville. <laughs> okay, guys, we need to move along. Thank you very much. I appreciate your input. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Does it make sense, Jeff, to ask why mutual, or do you think it was just an oversight that is very uncommon, or does it make sense to investigate as to why it wasn't? I will, I will ask them. It, it is an uncommon thing because we've had, I won't say numerous, but we've had other structure fires where we haven't had to make that call for Montpelier to come. Okay. So uh, I can, I will certainly check with dispatch and find out what the snafu was. And perhaps maybe in writing. There are a couple of people just to want it's I don't know who they are. Yeah, I don't know who they are. That okay. it's something on the on the the department's letterhead or something along mm -hmm. those lines. No, is that not <clears throat> I can do that. I was just going to email them. Yeah. Just in case something were to happen again. Similar, right. Just so we know that, yeah. That, that they would know that the town. Definitely. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. Anything else for the fire department? We do have a couple of people on the Zoom, and I'm sorry I can't read your names from here. Could you introduce yourselves, please? There's Norman Cohen. Norman Cohen, are you? Yes. And good then, evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, Bob was going to start off, and he ducked out for a minute. Um, well, who are they here for? Uh, they're, they're about to cut the other resolution here. Okay. Yeah. What? Just tell them you'll, you'll call. It'll be a few minutes. Oh, here he is. Yeah. Yes. Here he is. It'll be okay. It's going to be a couple of minutes till we get to the till we get to the resolution. Highway Department, gentlemen. Yes. Yep. Right, right. Sure. Uh, I handed out uh, the updated numbers for the two quotes we have for paving of Shady Road. Um, and I, I guess we have a $200,000 um, grant to cover a portion of this, obviously. Um, Brenda's not here, but do, we do have enough money in our paving fund to take up the rest. Um, so I guess we just need to figure out who we're going to want to have do it. Are you a... Do you have a recommendation? Uh, Pike came in less than Hutchins, and it's for the same, pretty close to the same tonnage in the uh, same square footage, or square yardage, rather. Yeah, we actually get a little bit more right out of uh, pipe. It looks like they're they're extending the... Yes, slightly just more. Just a little bit. Yep. Not much, but... 20 square yards. Um, so can I, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. I know, and maybe some of it was just kind of throwing stuff out there because of the, the amount of money that it costs to do these kinds of things, but... I know that there were uh, discussions brought up about reverting this back to back to gravel, um, and I'm just wondering if uh, folks here were uh, over that conversation um, or not. Good question. It costs more money to maintain a gravel road than it does a paved road. That's that's usually the the defense for that. But if the board would like to uh, bring it up and vote on it, we'll do it either way. Yep. I think that would be a decision that would be bigger than something I would want to call, make the call for. Right? How many years is it for paving? 15 is what we use in the CIP for okay. life cycle. And I know so just historically, to, just, just I'm sorry, just to reiterate, and I remember the discussion years ago when we 
it was either right after or right before we repaved that upper part of Shady Rill for the first time. So that was a long time ago. I couldn't tell you. But at that time, the concept was that we were going to pave all the way through. So we were going to have a paved route all the way through town. Well, that never happened. We put the squash to that. So, you know, the thing I struggle with is, okay, I understand why maybe it makes sense to have a paved road going to the school. Um, but in terms of our other paved roads, unless it truly is, and I've never been able to, you, you always say, Victor, that it's cheaper to maintain a, a paved road than a, than a gravel road. You question that? I, I just, looking at the cost of gravel and knowing that we've deferred the maintenance for that for so long, I mean, it, if you add up over the course of the life of the, of the asphalt and think about what you're going to put in there and then the man hours and wear and tear on the grader, I guess it probably wouldn't surprise me if it was equal to, if not more expensive. Um, you know, after you said that, I was kind of running some of the numbers through my head, just looking, we've, we've looked at gravel costs and, and whatnot a lot lately. So it probably isn't that surprising to me. I think the town would be very upset if we turned it into dirt. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I think there'd be a mutiny. I, I think for me, I just, I posed the question because it was brought up and yeah. I didn't feel like it was uh, ever anywhere that we really took very far. Um, and if we're sitting, and then we're sitting here and we're talking about awarding somebody a bid. So I just wanted to make sure that that this group didn't feel like it warranted further conversation. Gotcha. I think for the time being, our policy has been to maintain the paved roads we have. Mm -hmm. And we haven't changed that. We've had discussion, but we haven't changed it. And, yes, Sarah. Uh, isn't Shady Road a class two road? I'm sorry? Isn't it a class two road? If you were going to take it from, if you were going to take it from uh, pavement to gravel, you would. I think you'd have to change the classification of the road. I believe that is a class. I don't know. Where's where where are they defined? That's I'm on the, map. the AOT map. Oh, okay. It's downstairs on the map. Well, I'm okay. looking at that. I got it on the computer right now. I mean, it sounds like that yeah, conversation. It's yeah, kind it of a is. moot point because it okay. sounds like the all the right. group is all in in. Uh, favor of maintaining it as a paved road. Um, and again, sorry for the derailment, but I just. No, I think it's, I, I mean, it's a question that's come up off and on over the years because our, our plan or the plan, not our plan, but the plan to have a paved route through town never came to fruition. So, so how do we justify, you know, how do we justify having some roads paved and other roads not paved? It's a good question. It's a legitimate question. Where the flaw comes in, in my opinion, is we don't we don't address our paved roads on a timely matter. We let them go too long. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's basically about the capital that needs to go into them. Yeah. We wait for grants to be available. Right. Correct. Or, 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 um, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Right. And we've done that historically because we can't afford it without the grant. We can't afford to do it. Peter, I was sorry. I was just wondering, yes. is there? Um, are there any other mitigating factors for Eric other than just the dollar value, like timing and? No, no. Now is the time to get on the schedule mm -hmm. before it gets too late. This one says that the price is valid through three yeah. seven twenty three. Does you you don't you no, still think I they'll come in lower? To him. He says no. Okay. They know about it. They'll honor it. So okay. We decide to, if we choose to schedule it or not. And then you. Sorry, Peter. No, and, then, go ahead. and then you're looking to the, the board to decide between the two, or you're looking for permission for you to decide to, between the two? Either one. <laughs> we need to make a call. So we need to make a motion? Yeah, okay. We, we need to make a decision. Uh, I just want to point out it looks like you know there are some differences between the two. They're not necessarily apples to apples. You know, like. Um, Traffic control. So is that, I got is an that answer, something? I got an answer for that. I asked him about that, and he says the reason it states like that. He says they should, they should change it on there. They do provide traffic control, but it's not from them. It's from an outsource. Okay. Where Hutchins does their own personal traffic control. Okay, but we don't have to provide no. additional traffic no, control. No. 
it's included in that price. Correct. Um, I just have a question. I know people were, Peter, you had been mentioning something about, and I just biked on it, but I didn't notice it, the um, center road, the new paving. Somebody said the there cracks. was some yeah. cracks. Some cracks. I have not heard back from uh, Hutchins. I, I tried calling him about that. Okay. Um, those are something that we're going to have to just try to seal. Okay. Um, but is that related to any kind of like no, the, the process? I, no. Okay. That relates to the clay that is... Underneath the road. Okay. Because I know we talked about like you take the road off and you grind it up and you use it versus remember there's the other yeah, thing. Yeah, but we would have to dig down like six feet. Okay. And rebuild the road. That's the problem. Okay. Okay. I mean, the only base itself yes. is what's what's yes. compromised. Okay. Right. right. But you can't build on clay and expect it not to move in the winter. And you can't expect to get the same results like they do out here on Route Two or whatever. Because number one, you don't have a contract. Number two, you don't have any specifications. And number three, you don't have any inspection when you're putting it down. So you're kind of you're kind of relying on them to be trustworthy. I like how they have to bid that is 2021. And I don't think on these two, <laughs> I don't these two contractors. Flag, I, mean, I don't think there's flag, one please. that's less or more trustworthy than no. the other. I'd make the motion we'd go with Pike Industries. It's, uh and you said, as far as timing, there's no significant timing difference between the two or, or no, anything that like that? Was, not that I had gathered from talking with them. When on a regular day, again? on a regular day, we'd struggle hard to find $5,000. When so. is it happening? If we, if we <laughs> I would like it to happen somewhere right after the 1st of July. Okay. That would pay That's for us. That's awesome. Seat. All right. So it has been moved. Is there a second? Randy, second. So all in favor of accepting the contract with Pike Industries to repave that portion of Shady Rail Road, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, other road issues, let's see. We graded Center Road, uh, French Road. Uh, I shut off to buses today because it opened up quite badly. Uh, it is passable with cars, but anything heavier than that, nope. Um, the buses will be not running next week, so we have okay. some time for that to heal up. Um, we're going to hit Portal Road tomorrow in McCullough and do some other grading spots, but other than that, we're in pretty good shape. Great. Yeah, we did today. You'll probably hit it again. So I have a I have a related but a different question. Sure. The things I observe riding around town are the school bus is going where maybe they shouldn't go. Number one, but number two, the oil and propane trucks. Mm -hmm. About the garbage trucks. I mean, garbage trucks. Well, and the garbage trucks. Garbage yeah. trucks will stop if you call. Yes. You have to call uh, Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan. But is there, is there any way, probably I know the answer to this, but I'm asking the question, to encourage and or discourage these oil companies like, you know, I know they're all scrambling around, I know they all don't have adequate help, but, you know, they know when the roads are going to get muddy. Can't they fill up the tanks on those roads before they get muddy? It is an endless battle. And they say that they're essential, so they don't. They are exempt. So they are exempt, but I do not believe they are. I think the only ones that are exempt are agricultural from driving on our roads, even though they're posted. Well, I can tell you they believe they're exempt because I've talked to them. I know they do. the The issue is uh, if the issue is money, because some people get their propane, oil, whatever, months to months, and, and they don't have, you know, they don't fill up their tank. So they, you know, they budget it month to month. I understand, but if you're an oil company, can't you say, we'll trust can't you, you send out a letter and say, you know, mud season is coming, we need to fill your up tank yeah. up now, because we're not going to promise you no, we can come they during mud season. For it. They won't hold, right, they're not going to go pre-deliver for some clientele. You know, some of these people are on, like, you know, basically cash on delivery type yeah. type yeah. of deals yeah. where I know. they've got I mean, to go I was out. Trying to 
and and physically call them when they see that the meter is down to you know five percent and they actually have the money so you know we're putting people at in a position where right. and i do i have heard that they are completely exempt from that because um, of the service that they provide mm -hmm. and it's something to look into but you know we're putting people in position where all of a sudden they have no heat they have no hot water um, no, because, I get it. because they run out so i get it i get it but i'm just i'm just saying so the problem is and we've all seen it you know the road's okay for cars light pickup trucks whatever can drive over it it's fine and all of a sudden you see this great big 10 wheel propane truck coming up and they sink in about a foot and a half and then it's over after that and they rumble they somehow manage to rumble through sometimes they don't sometimes they have to get towed but yeah it's a problem yeah because anyway have, we have the buses shut off on uh, south bear swamp as well this yeah morning. yeah okay should have done that a day day earlier yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Should have done it last thursday yeah. 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 Didn't go down there. <laughs> um i think that's east hill yeah east hill was done today You guys are hey guys, this is Paul Sermonara. Can I can I just ask a quick question? Are are we still do, actively working on mud like mud season mitigating? It had been pretty successful and pretty popular here a few years back. Are we still doing that, or have we put off efforts of trying to work towards some of these real uh, habitual bad areas and and not trying to mitigate those anymore? We have not done that last year. Um, when I came on, we just there was no time to do that. I don't know what the plan is moving forward at this time, um, and what was previously done prior to me. So I can only answer for last summer. Don't we have some mud season oh. mitigation in our in our plan yes, for next do. year? I yeah. believe we do. Yeah, we use a lot of our gravel right now, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the other thing is, Paul, as you know, when, you know, that question was asked by me, uh, to me, by people on East Hill, why don't we do that like you did around, well, mm -hmm. but when you, you know, I'm not saying not to do it, but when you do, you have to, you have to put all your, your forces in that one thing, and then all the rest of the roads in the town go to heck. Okay, so just to be clear, we're talking about really the difference between road construction efforts and right. road maintenance right. efforts. Right. Right. Yes. Um, I just wanted to make sure we weren't talking about just gravel and, and things right. like that. For, no, correct. No, right. it's road rebuilding. Right. Yeah. Sections, sections of road rebuilding. Yeah. Yes. No, oh, and I, I appreciate that. I, I think, at least in my experience, the concern from the, the general public had been, you know, fire, EMS, uh, medical response, and, and things of that nature, and, and obviously school bus safety and travel. Um, you know, so it, it just seems it, it's a little tough to swallow where, where myself and the board made such a big push to, to try and start actively working on, on and I'm, I don't mean in just a random place. I mean the place that I, I could drive around today and know exactly where they are because they've been happening since since before my tenor. Um, you know, we had great success doing it, and and I do not disagree at all that that you know it's a limited group of of workers and equipment and time and resources. So I certainly understand we've we've got a no pun intended Rob Rob Peter to pay Paul type of thing. I I understand that. Um, you know, but when I see pictures and and I drive around town and see some of these things i i just feel like we need to still put at least a little bit of emphasis on our main arteries because seeing a school bus stuck or or trying to help people out or or you know even delivery trucks and stuff um on on our main roads just just seems to me like we need to still put a little bit of emphasis there maybe not as much as as we may have at one time but but some of it to know that because these places are, are not going to get any better. They'll continue to get worse. And I think we all know that. No, I agree. I agree with you, Paul, 100%. And uh, it's just a balancing act of how we do that while, while, not, uh, while not missing out on the rest of it. And I think, I think that one of the issues is also uh, uh, 
there was when when you did it, and, and it were it did good, it was a good thing. I don't I don't mean to negate anything, uh, but you did have a newer excavator, and our excavator is getting old, and I don't think we're up to re replace that until twenty six this year. No, it's this year. This year. It's in twenty four. Yeah. 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 Well, it's getting tired. It is. But I will say the places that he did are really in great shape, and you can tell the difference oh, yeah, no, when you're driving. Absolutely, I agree 100%. It was worth it. Yeah, yeah right. So I, I just want to point out that conversations uh, that I've been involved with or whatnot through this group have, have you know, not steered away from the thought of doing those construction projects as a whole but maybe looking at doing them outside of our road crew and letting our crew focus on maintenance efforts and, and not necessarily deferring all of that. So, um, you know, it may be that we, we get to those less often um, because we've got a contract for those types of services and, and whatnot, but um, at least in my mind, um, through some of those conversations, that's that's, that's where my mindset is, is to let the road crew focus on maintenance and not construction. And when we find construction recommendations from, from Eric and Victor, um, you know, that are put into, you know, the future budgets and whatnot, those are looked at as a, a separate item from what the road crew is necessarily going to implement. And when, and when they did that, when, when Paul did that, he also put in a lot of drainage. Mm -hmm. They put in a lot of under oh, drain, got rid of the surf, the water down, and uh, which you know by putting gravel on a existing road doesn't doesn't help that situation. Yeah. No. So. It certainly, Paul, is a good idea. No, and I again, not, not I'm not trying to pick a battle here, guys. To me, it's it's more of a continuing effort, and and like I said, I completely appreciate the limited amount of resource more you know more than anybody here I, I can appreciate it so i just you know i would love to make sure that we are still trying to make it at least small progress on those on on our main arteries that that every year are just complete quagmires you know because obviously you know uh, medical and fire response and and school bus safety near and dear to our hearts so uh just just something i wanted to bring up and and put a little light on so we can make some emphasis there in the future. Well, however you guys decide to divvy it up. Well, thank you, Paul. I mean, uh, that is, uh, you're making an excellent point. And, you know, if uh, it may get us to thinking about it and uh, we may act on it a little quicker than we would have if you hadn't said anything. So we appreciate <laughs> it. Mysteriously, it always seems to come up about the third week in April of every year, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder why that is. Thank you, Paul. Um, Thank so, you. So the other issue we have just quickly under under Highway Department report is uh, the Mead Road uh, situation and issues. Um, I did have another conversation with the uh, with the town attorney, and uh, Victor and I had a conversation the other day. We are going to have him uh, draft a letter, which we will send to uh, to Zach French uh, at Al. Our plan is to re-gravel the traveled right of way, not the whole right of way, but the traveled right of way. Roadbed. And yes, and then to that this letter will say, you know, you cannot park, leave equipment, block or any way impede or alter that right of way, excuse me, traveled right of way without prior permission. And if you choose to go ahead and do that in the future, penalties will apply or whatever the magic word is the attorney comes up with, but we are close to doing that. So I would hope that letter could go out in the next week or so. And I don't know when you gentlemen are planning to do that work, sometime this summer? Yeah, I mean, we can do it. I would imagine within the next month or so. Yeah. So we are trying to make progress on that. I know it seems like the forever, uh, we've got a lot on our plate as you, as you hear when you attend these meetings. 
The, the other thing he did, and I believe I said this the, the, at, the, at the last meeting, but we do have, we do have legal recourse um, if we choose to take it and have to take it. Hopefully that will not be the case, but we'll see what happens. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, moving along, we have a request that the Middlesex Select Board approve a declaration of inclusion we all have a copy of that declaration in our uh, in our packets, and I believe we have uh, people here on the Zoom who would like to address us on that subject. That is correct. Thank you very much, and I wanted to thank Sarah for getting us on the uh, agenda, and thank you as well. Um, my name is Bob Harnish, um, and I'm here with uh, my colleague Norm Cohen. Good evening. And uh, I'm going to read some of my remarks just a bit to be in the interest of being uh, brief and uh, not take up too much of your time. Um, I hope I think you indicated in your opening remarks that uh, that you have information in your packet, uh, including the uh, including a, a suggested yeah. uh, declaration of inclusion. Great, great. Um, well, we're here regarding our statewide effort to have all towns and cities adopt a statement that says that they want their town to be a place where folks are unbiased and respectful of all people. <clears throat> um, regardless of their religion, ethnicity, socioeconomic uh, condition or, or whatever. We call this a declaration of inclusion, and um, you have a copy. Uh, most towns have used our suggested wording, but some towns um, have changed a few words or, or rewritten it substantially. If that's if that's the if that's a desire by by a town, then we're we're happy to work with 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 you. Um, so far, this initiative has been endorsed by 110 cities and towns, and as well as the governor, and uh, uh, who, who has issued a proclamation uh, of inclusion for the state of Vermont. But uh, it, it's uh, it's our in, intention to have uh, every town uh, adopt uh, and consider a statement of of this sort. So in addition, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, the Vermont State Chamber of Commerce, the Social Equity Caucus of the House of Representatives, the Vermont Interfaith Action Alliance, and many other, many of the regional planning commissions have all become our allies in this effort. To go back to the beginning, in September of 2020, uh, my, my, my cousin, who's chair of the uh, select board in Franklin, told me that his select board had, uh, had adopted a declaration of inclusion, which had been introduced by one of the, one of the selectmen. And, uh, and he uh, got me a copy of it. And uh, I, was, I was so impressed by the, by the language uh, of it and the, and the, uh, long, and the, and the intent that, um, that I presented it in our town of Pittsford, just north of Rutland, and then it was uh, introduced and, and, and adopted in Brandon, the next town north. And uh, at that point, I, I decided it, it, it perhaps could go further, and I called a friend of uh, Al Wakefield uh, and Norm Cohen, who is with us tonight. And since we started this effort, the uh, the 2020 census has has been concluded, and we had we have the report, which which tells us that that the population of Vermont is is not only stagnant, uh, it barely grew two percent in ten years, uh, but it's also uh, an aging population, and and this is a this is not a good combination for the long term economic vitality of the state. And so, um, so we feel not only is is, uh, um, is this a uh, a moral issue; it's also an economic issue for the state of Vermont. 
to make more, Vermont more welcoming to, to people. And to do that, we, we want people to feel comfortable here. We want people to feel respected and, uh, and that they belong in their, in their communities and they're part of their communities. Um, so with that, uh, let me uh, just sum up by saying this is a grassroots effort to help communities be more welcoming and respectful of all current and future citizens. And this is the way we can make Vermont a desirable place to live and also a magnet for business and people wanting to start new businesses. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Norm for, for a few remarks. Well, thank you, Bob. You said most everything that I could say, so I'm going to try to be brief, which is difficult for a retired lawyer. So please bear with me. Um, just a couple of things to more or less fill in. Uh, Governor Scott has been extremely supportive. If you have time to read the declaration uh, or the proclamation he issued in 2021, it is really far-reaching, emphatic, and meaningful. Um, and um, he's also followed that up in the last two years, and we understand he will do the same this year and establish the second week in May as inclusion week. Um, and that is when towns are encouraged to be public with their programs. And um, some have, some have done it more modestly. Uh, the standard bearer so far has been the town of Milton. Um, the um, Bob mentioned the declaration and changing the language. And um, we certainly are receptive to that. Nothing is cast in concrete, but some people have wandered off the reservation a little bit. And um, so we have established some guidelines which are in the um, uh, documents we prepared for government leadership and I would suggest if you feel the necessity to do it, uh, that you take a look at those and uh, it will mean, you know, it will help us both along. Um, Bob has covered most of it uh, and very well, of course. Um, would say that we now have a fourth person with us, a woman named Barbara Pulling, who joined us about a month and a half ago and whose uh, presence is already felt. Barbara is a native of Monner. Her, her roots go back to 1794. Uh, she works at the Rutland Regional Planning Commission, and she is the chair of the Rutland Town Planning Commission, and we have served on that together for seven years, and we're privileged to have her. Um, the only thing she's done is, is add youth to our, our effort. All three of us are over 80, and um, we're, one, happy to be here and happy to be so involved and in such a meaningful uh, uh, meaningful effort, and uh, appreciate the time you've given us. So we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, Bridget. Um, I would just like to go ahead and make the motion that we include the dec or that we move forward with the declaration. In their website, there's two different categories: the quick and easy, and then there's the in-depth. <clears throat> uh, perhaps if we moved forward with the with the quick and easy, um, and then uh, put something on front page forum um, where we invite someone to volunteer. Um, the the other pro the project involves a. Uh, designating a committee um, so rather than the select board create a new town committee I think that um, that might be a, a way for us to do some recruitment of folks who might want to take it to the next level so is this the, the that one is, we have is the quick and easy that's one. the quick and easy the one here. and if we do the quick and easy what what we're looking at is um, uh, hanging a framed copy at the town clerk's office, um, uh, put it in the town newsletter, so that would be online, um, and then um, uh, include it in the town's annual report. And then we, I say we go step four to see if, um, if Sarah or someone else wants to put something on front page forum, and then see if someone else wants to take it further. Um, the, I'd just like to note that 
um, that the declaration is supported by the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Vermont Interfaith Action, League of Cities and Towns, Social Equity Caucus, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Vermont. Um, it's supported by the governor. Um, and I think, what is the number of towns thus far that have approved or accepted? Gentlemen? 110. 110 out of 251. So. Did he what? say there was one town that didn't? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think one town went further in uh, Milton. Um, has has um, it sounds to me like there will be a um, there will be some organizing at the state level, multiple towns, and if Middlesex had someone interested in volunteering, uh, they could participate in conversations about how perhaps Middle Middlesex could become more involved. Um, but I don't think that at this <coughs> stage that the that the select board would have to create a committee of town members. So okay. I, I just like to I'd like to make that motion and okay. then see what other folks feel. And I would second that. Any further discussion? I just don't understand what the value of our town doing it when it's at the state level already. I, I, I mean I don't I don't understand the uh, and then if you read that, you sit here and you listen to this gentleman right here and he's already got a conflict in here of what you're declaring. I don't know if I understand, Vic. Well, he what just said, he, he, he brought up, you know, it's like, he just brought up that this woman, I believe it was a woman that joined, you know, and, and I'm really, I don't really want to say anything because you end up a bad guy, but you know, you can't say anything because you're a bad guy if you say anything. But he just said that this woman was seventh generation blah, and the rest of the stuff. So if I'm not, if I'm not, a, that's not welcoming out of staters. It's like if you're, a, a, which has been in the state of Vermont for a long time. So I'm a native Vermonter. I mean, that's not welcoming. That's not, you know, uh, that's not meeting your own. Um, declaration. So I, I think it's better. I think it's just better if you let the governor do it and leave it at the governor or let it, leave it at the state. Let, it doesn't mean you don't do it. It doesn't mean it's a personal thing. It's a personal uh, 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 de uh, uh, declaration of, of your, uh, your own values. I don't, I don't see forcing it or telling people that this is what the town is or is going to do is, is beneficial. I just can't see that. Maybe I'm wrong. But. All I would say, Victor, is anything, anything that can be done to encourage these values, to me, feels like a good thing. I mean, to me, it seems like common sense. There are certainly some people who don't necessarily feel this way. But for our town to go on record and say, yes, we support these values in this, in this relatively limited way, I, think I don't see how it can hurt. And if, in fact, it helps, that's a good thing. I so think, that's my answer to that. I think it is kind of in line with the majority of how townspeople would feel. And I think that not only just in Middlesex, but in our region. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that by us not participating, um, it, it does whether you mean it or not, it kind of sends a message. I agree. Right. Yep. I mean, I understand that part of it. I understand that, uh, you know, I think there's more politics in this declaration than there is anything else. I mean, you get right down to it, it's, it's, it's politics. It's who, who, what you believe in. Do we want our state and our community to be welcoming? Yes. I we do. do, and that's yes, that's we do. But when you have conflict of terms in here, you're not. All you're doing is causing turmoil. Well, you said it yourself, Peter. And and you know you said that, that it could open the town up to. A, uh, you don't think that this anymore? This is a declaration. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it, yes, we are it's not, not putting not a, a law in place. I think. Right. For, I think for me, it's. I agree. 
to a point with Victor. I mean, I don't, it's not that I don't support any of this stuff. I mean, when, why does it have to be every time you turn around, you've got to sign a piece of paper and declare what you stand for? What, what happened to just general human decency and, and people, uh, you know, being able to, to just be decent humans instead of having to say, oh, I stand for this or I stand for that. I just, for me, I think there, it comes, there comes a point in time when, where things like this almost drive some of the divisiveness that this country faces. Correct. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and it's not that people don't support this, but to, to hammer on your, the first thing you said is like, if you don't do this, like everybody is automatically jumps to, okay, you know, they're a racist or they're, you know, they're against, um, you know, folks with gender ide uh, identity issues or, you know, whatever the case may be. And I just, for me, there's a sense of like, how much is too much? And at what point do we I just I don't think this is too humans? much though, especially think. because we're being asked. I mean, it'd be one thing if someone on the committee had an agenda per se. Um, but every town is being asked to, um, to, to take a look at this language and, and decide whether or not do, do we stand on the side of being welcoming. And why wasn't it good enough for the state to do it? And why does every town have to it do, do it? But that's it's, a moot point because the fact is, is that we're being asked. It's not up to ask, us to ask why. If you get asked something, it doesn't mean you have to do it. No. 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 You could choose to vote against this. That's Ex what we're here for. Exactly. Right. So but we're we being, have... the request is there. I made the motion that we, that we move on the request uh, within a, um, the quickie, quick and easy category that we don't have to um, uh, create a committee per se that is also explained on the website. Um, but it is um, looking at the language right in front of us, um, I think that this is a reasonable request. Yep. The only, okay. thing, so the only thing I'd say is like, you know, like Randy said, and if, if you vote no, you're not thought of in a positive way. You might as well wear a MAGA hat. Well, you could also abstain. Oh, yeah. thank you. You don't have to vote no. You don't have to vote no. Okay, thank, thank you. That's, you're, that's right. I have a MAGA hat. That doesn't mean that, I mean, you're looking at a symbol per se. I mean, that, you know, somebody can, no. you, you, it's, I mean, my brother gave it to me, but that doesn't mean, it's just, you're not. You don't have it on tonight. No, but I'm just saying that you're taking it to a level of conversation that it doesn't really need to go. That, um, well, but, but I'm just saying that. That's part of the issue that I have with stuff like this, is it, it almost becomes, Right. It takes it to a place where it doesn't need to be. And, and for me, it's not that I don't support any of this stuff, you know, right. and I agree with the ideologies and, and, and I totally, for me, it just comes down to, you know, just be decent human beings. We don't need to write it on a piece of paper. We don't need to, like, go out and shout, you know, what our beliefs are everywhere. We just, we need people to be decent. And, and for me, it just... There's too much of the, well, you've got to declare what you are these days, and you've got to, you've got to tell everybody what your stances are, and, and you know. But I, I it, think it, that we're, you're reading into it something that is not at the, at the level that is being presented to and us. And I'll, I'll agree with you that it's not yeah. just this, this is, for this me. Is pretty, this is pretty basic. It's a bigger, yeah. it's a, it's a bigger issue that this falls under. And, and it, it really is talking about language that I'm sure has come up in town discussions before, which involves safety. And so it's, it's safety and being welcoming. And how can you say no to that? So we need to vote. Thank you. I'll be quiet. So all those in favor of the motion, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Two abstentions. OK. We have adopted the Declaration of Inclusion. Gentlemen, thank you for your uh, input and support. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for this, uh, for this lively discussion. And uh, we're very, very happy to have a, 
a vote of three of you. And uh, I hope the uh, other gentlemen will, will see the value of it. I, I know all towns want to become uh, safer places where, where there aren't uh, racial incidents or incidents of any of any kind with a marginalized someone, you know, a marginalized group. Um, we very much appreciate your time and your discussion. Yes, yeah, so I'd just like to add my thanks and uh, appreciate the time you gave it and the intense concentration. Uh, would, we would ask if you would send a signed copy to Bob. Once we have the signed copy, then we um, we count you publicly and increase our numbers on our website. So well, when you have a chance to... Go ahead, Tara. So I don't see anything in the declaration that says it needs to be signed by the select board. Is there something that says it needs to be signed by the select board? The declaration that I print out just says, as approved by the Bill Sex Select Board. Do you need it signed? We like what we, the declaration that's in the packet that, that you have and before you, we'd like that signed and dated. By who? By who? By the select board. Individual members of the select board? Yes. You need some more lines. Uh, well, could could Peter just sign? For the board? It, it, it says by the uh, Middlesex Select Board, and then maybe just Peter could sign. Or it doesn't matter. No. I'm sorry. No, That'll work. That That'll work. I'll just sign it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. Have a good, good night, night, gentlemen. Considering renewal of a class one and three and outside liquor permit for the filling station, is there a motion? I move that we uh, uh, renew the class one and three outside liquor permit for the filling station. Is there a second? I will support that. I will. Seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, orders need to be signed. They're here. Yep. And correspondence, Sarah? Um, no, I don't have any correspondence. But in your packet, um, I did have some things in your packet. I did put the VLC template for models of running a, a select board meeting. I know you guys passed over it while I was on vacation. But I would really like you guys to take a serious look at it and bring it up at our next meeting. Because okay. I think with all this public participation we're having, we need to have some order here. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'd like two if somebody needs one. I don't know if you, somebody didn't get a copy. But this maybe. goes back to like modified Roberts. Is that? Yeah. Because yeah. Roberts rules didn't really apply to the select board and VLCT doesn't recommend them. But there are, there are important things here such as that I, you know, I just want to draw your attention to while you're reading it, such as. Um, public participation, all meetings of the body are, are meetings in public, not of the public. Pub members of the public shall be afforded reasonable opportunity to express opinions about matters considered by the body so long as order is maintained. So I think that's an important part. And some other things you guys could should consider when you're looking it over is whether or not is there any limit to the times a member of the body may speak to a question? Um, you know, how to just how to conduct a meeting. You could even do, do you need two people to make a motion or will one work? You know, so things like that. Just stuff to streamline our meetings so that they go along orderly and without getting into private discussions. Mm -hmm. All right. Sarah. Yes, sir. Sorry, I got in. I kind of I shouldn't have done it. No, right, you're fine. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, I'll talk, I'll just say briefly yep. about BIA. Yep, go ahead. Um, so we have a meeting, the subcommittee has a meeting on um, May 1st here at Town Hall with BIA to talk about next steps, so. Is that a regular select board meeting? No, special? it's not. It's this Monday, May 1st. With this, yeah, it's just the subcommittee, like me and Dave and Sarah and Sandy. Oh, so the whole select board doesn't attend? No, I no. mean, you could if you want, but then we'd, we would warn it probably. Warn but it. we don't want to, I mean, these are just the subcommittees. Like, we will have a meeting where we present to the select board what we've learned, but we're just meeting with them to 
talk about where they are right now in the process and then um, the next steps for them. Um, and then at that meeting, we probably will figure out a time to meet at the select board meeting to talk about and uh, to give you guys an update. What time is that meeting? 3.30 to 5.30 on Monday, May 1st here. Mayday. Oh, is that? Yeah. Thank you for that sign, by the way. You're it's a little far. Huh? Is that, is that, is that, do you What's think that? it's too far away from the scene? It's right by that post with a red ribbon on it, isn't it? It's like kind of far. Okay. I was a little surprised. I mean, then I was wondering if there was going to be a second sign. Okay. Um, like closer to it. Because okay. it shows that the road is weaving. Like, you're about to see a weaving road. <laughs> <laughs> 25 miles an hour. I like that. I will ask, I will ask it, Eric tomorrow morning when, he, when we talk. Thank you. How does it weave? Like this. <laughs> More than an S. Um, and then, and Randy and I we, I, we briefly touched about it, but we did attend the, um, the meeting um, today about the Municipal Energy Resilience Program. And there's a $4,000 grant that everyone will get if we apply for it. I know that the um, the energy committee would like 500 of that because it's kind of design. It's it's used for, and they will apply for it if we give them the okay. I don't even think we necessarily need to like vote on it or anything. But um, but the 4,000 could be used for. It, it's more like it, it could be used to like form an energy committee, but we already have one. It can be do. It could be used for outreach for the community about energy stuff. So. They, they would like to, you know, set aside 500 to do, you know, outreach events for the um, energy committee. But we can also use it um, toward, like, if we wanted to hire someone to write the grant, the $500,000 grant. Um, we don't have to apply for it today, um, but it's, I guess I just wanted to throw that out there. There were some other things we could use for it. Yeah, it's pretty flexible. Money. Yeah. It, but it's really meant for, you know, it's not like it wouldn't pay. I mean, it, we, it, we could probably even contribute to if VIA cost more. It, if it ended up, we could put some of that towards the VIA. It's available for like clerk of the work type work, yeah. all kinds of stuff. So if we needed somebody to oversee construction project, if we get to that point, it could be used for that. Um, lots right. of different things. It's not a lot of money, right? I mean, for It'll that thing. Up but pretty quick. Yeah, that, but, but at any rate, if it's. Um, if it makes sense to you, I did ask uh, the Energy Committee to take a look at the grant and, you know, see what the process was, because it's already available to apply for. Um, but we, it's, we're just leaving money on the table if we don't apply for it. It's not you're like... You're talking about the, I'm sorry, just to put a word, yeah. you're talking about applying for that grant, you're just talking about the $4,000. The $4,000 one, yeah, yeah. But part of it could be that you include in it that we would hire someone to write the $500,000 grant. I think that's a good idea. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah. I do too. I think so too. I mean, I think it I would think be that, worthwhile. That's going to be a big. If you miss that window, mm -hmm. if if you don't have it put, presented in such a way that. Oh yeah, I'm not sure that it didn't sound like you know if we if we didn't write that in the grant that we couldn't spend it on that right. later on. I this seemed pretty flexible. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I anyway, if it's all right with you guys, I'll I'll, I'll have the energy committee just look through it and talk about it, see if there's something besides, I mean, I don't think, they, they didn't want more than $500 for whatever events they're doing. Um, but um, I think the grant writing makes sense. Because we're going to need to apply for, we're going to use that money for something. Even if we, even if we get back from VIA, that's going to cost $2 million to renovate this building, however much it's going to cost, right? And even if the town says, no, we're not going to bond for this, we're not going to do anything for this building, we know that we still need to, like, replace the heating system, right? So we're going to need to apply for this funding um, to do something, even if we don't go through a full rehab of this building. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Yep. It would be foolish to not use that 500000 for the things that we may need regardless of what we end up doing. We'll be able to building. use it. We'll be able to use something of it, yes. 
And as and what they did also say today, which I think we probably knew this already, is that the assessment will tell us what we need, and therefore, um, you know, we're not just going to ask for 500 and get 500, right? Like we'll ask for what the assessment recommends, but that may, I would imagine that would also include what VIA says in theirs, like, oh, we need all new windows because it pays for windows, it pays for heating system, it pays for insulation. 20, um, up to 20% for ADA yes, compliance. Yes, 20% ADA compliance. Awesome, yes. And I mean, it's, it, 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 they did clarify that it doesn't have to meet ADA compliance 100%, it's just being more compliant than you, than you already are. Yep. So. Right. Okay, that's all. Okay, anything else, anyone? So we're clear that we're okay with the Energy Committee moving forward and looking into that grant and, and presenting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. Okay, I would say we are adjourned. <laughs>